Not Hello. yet. Hello. Well, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, and go on ahead, yeah. Hello and welcome to the second edition of the NJ podcast with me, Niall Gagan, and main uh, presenter, uh, John McMahon. Our special guest today, we have Tyrone football legend, Conor Gormley. John, how are you keeping? Um, I am good, Niall, yeah, geez, um, thanks for asking. Um, thank, uh, all good kind of campaign, so uh, just uh, delighted to be joined by Conor tonight. Good stuff, yeah, we're joined by a legend of the game here tonight. Uh, I have a list of achievements here. Uh, <laughs> basically, three All-Ireland titles, four All-Star titles, three All-Stars and represented Tyrone from 2001 to 2014. Connor, where did it all go wrong from that now? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad list to have. Um, first of no, all, the mighty stuff. We'll start off, Connor. Yeah. First of all, I'll ask you how are you managing with the whole lockdown situation? How are you getting by, uh, killing the days in? Or what's the situation there? Uh, I just basically just uh, homeschooling at the minute, just the three wee ones there. So they're uh, the twins there. So they were just seven last week there. So they're in P3 here. So working with them and then an older boy, he's nine. So working away with him too in P5. So it's homeschooling more or less every, every day. So it'd be. Good crack and plenty of patience needed, you know. I don't oh, uh, drive you mad not day, not time, you know, but it sure, has to be done, unfortunately. Yeah, oh yeah, you need that. Keeps you busy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we'll go back a few years there, Connor, so we'll, uh, we'll get started with the football here. So we'll just, right. uh, I suppose it all kicked off really for Tyrone in 2003. Now, it was probably, I'd say, a, a bit of motivation was probably maybe looking at Armagh in 2002. Did you perhaps look at them and decide that, you know, you were maybe that wee bit better, or if not as good as, as Armagh? Um, and, and was that kind of a, a motivation for you to push on in 2003? I definitely was when you seen your neighbours so close to us, doing so well in 2002. And ourselves maybe coming off the back of getting beat in a, in a qualifying group park by Sligo. After sort of playing well in the first half and then fell apart, do you want to say maybe in the second half against Lego? And luckily, in Armagh, go on Armagh, won their land in 2002. It was a massive, a massive thing for for them. And then we had Mickey coming in sort of the end of the end of I think it was November 2002. He sort of changed the mindset a wee bit, and he would have mentioned to Armagh surely that if Armagh can do it, why can we not do it? You know, so he laid down the gauntlet for us as, as players. Do we want to? Achieve the highest we can we can achieve as as one the Sam and that first meeting he really in, in, installed a, a belief in us that we can go and do it. It's going to take a lot of hard work and you need a, a rub of the green or two along the way. But sort of from that first meeting and, and seeing our ma win it, but the year before was a massive massive driving factor in the whole thing. You know, and a new Mickey coming in as a new manager, I suppose a new fresh a fresh backroom team and all the rest coming in. Paddy Tally sort of changed the routine that we had been used to was massive. Well, Paddy was. Well, ahead of the game at that stage, like his training was exceptional. You really, you really enjoy going to training. You know that sort of way. It was just was the, all game based, and all match related, and really enjoyable. And then we few wee things all clicked in the pace, and thankfully we got the reward in September that year. Yeah, and uh, I suppose beating Kerry was massive that year. And um, I suppose to make the breakthrough, you really do have to beat uh, Kerry or Dublin. That's the two main teams in the country, really. Um, I suppose teams in the past, maybe Tyrone teams would have given them teams a wee bit too much respect um, and were kind of in awe of, of the great footballers. Um, what what was your mindset uh, going into that Kerry, Kerry game in 2003 um, that was a wee bit different from maybe previous years when you were again a, a top dog? Um, well, I think maybe and also a game maybe that was a turning point was Armagh in the National League in 2002 up in Oma. Uh, packed house and a really intense intense game and uh, I think we beat them maybe by a point that day so it was a, a bit of a game changer as well that we can compete with Armagh and you say the big teams like so it was a, a massive boost and, boost and, and confidence for us um, going into that Kerry game in the Ireland semi-final um, we're coming back off the back of winning National League and coming back off then the back of winning Ulster getting through eventually after a couple of a couple of hairy scares like you know that, that year as well against against uh, Gavin against Down as well, like so tough couple of games, but we had no really fear of of, of Kerry. The the boys would have played them at, at minor level, I think at minor level maybe ninety seven, 
uh, beat them and learn semi final as well after maybe extra time and really bad day down in Parnell Park. So they knew what it took to, to beat Kerry as well. Like so, but Mickey had again installed that belief in us. And we look forward to that game. And as you can see from the, the video clip, it's now famous video clip there along the, the Hogan style, the tackling, the boys done the intensity that went about. That, that was just. That'll live on for years and years to come. That 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 that, that we clip like so. That was sort of what Mickey drilled into us. That just every ball mattered, and every every tackle, every play, everything, every second mattered. And we just went about that game just as the, our lives depended on it. And it was just a challenge we relished. And I think we maybe shocked we, we shocked Kerry that day. Maybe shocked a lot of people that day over Ireland. So it was just a and then from that on it sort of laid the foundation of what we achieved after that. I think that performance. So that that day getting over, as you say, one of the big guns. Yeah, yeah, you still get goosebumps uh, looking back at that tackling, even to this day. Fantastic. Um, I'll bring John in here now. That's great stuff, boys. And look, I suppose we're, we're remarking on the Toronto teams of 0305 and bits and pieces, but Connor, what was it like to play with the likes of Peter Canavan and Owen Mulligan and boys like that? Because Sean Cavanagh, like, you're only going to improve by playing with lads like that. Oh, without a doubt, like, you know, you went to went to training or went in house games, like, where do you go as a defender? You know, you've uh, Owen Mulligan inside, you've Steve O'Neill, you've Peter Canavan, uh, you have on the wing maybe Jared Cavan, 2003, you've Brian McGuigan, uh, you've Sean Cavan coming through, you know, where do you, where do you go there to have a handy day? Like, you know, there's no <laughs> chance they, a handy in house game or say, right, I'll, I'll take him, like, you know, as a cornerback or someone like you're in Mark and Cannon or Stevie you know, like it's night, nightmare stuff like you know and that sort of that helped me as a defender you know I'm going to mark the best forwards that's ever played the game and likes of Peter and you have Stevie coming up and through the ranks and Muggsy like you know just they really brought me on as a defender because every night I knew that I'm going to be tested here I have to think on my feet and not just going to thin and to go through the, through the motions if I do that I'm not going to learn I'm not going to learn from myself or I'm not going to help my teammates improve as well, you know, test Stevie or test Kenham. I mean, you know, that I have to bring my A game every night at training. So it was a massive, a massive, massive thing as a, a young fella. I learned a lot in them first few years playing against them boys and training against them was was massive and it really helped me as a defender. So it was, it was enjoyable, definitely was. And they're, again, they're all great characters as well, which was helped the thing, helped the team bond and all that as well. So it was massive, but just a great experience and someone to look back on, you know, fondly that I can know them as teammates, but also uh, they're uh, great friends now as well. Yeah, yeah, fascinating stuff. And like, I suppose we were talking to Manny Ford there and uh, Paul Herity on Saturday and they were kind of remarking the game back in say 08 and 07 and it was very enjoyable to play. And like, how high was the standard back in 03 and 05, Connor? Because they were just unbelievable games of football and, you know, Everyone was so enthralled in them, essentially. I th- I don't believe the, the standard was very high that time. You know, I think any you know, teams would compete in the modern era, you know, very, very well as well. You know, so, so I think the transition from Nordies to, so, you know, this time of year, this, this period of football, I think they would no bother playing it. You know, the transition very, very well. But just to probably were exciting games, they were maybe just a bit more open, maybe. You know, from a forward point of view, you know, the likes of Matty Ford there, like one of the best forwards that ever played the game and give me... Tough, tough times, Mark. And a few times was was very, very hard, you know. So be a bit more open, maybe a bit more man for man as a as a defender. You had to fight your own corner compared to maybe now. There's a, the more blanket defences and next to defenders and everybody back behind the forty five. So it was a bit more open and maybe a bit more entertaining at times. I say a bit more uh, up and down, maybe you know. There's more more go, maybe now. There's a bit of you know, everybody drops back. There's a bit of a, a lull in games. So sometimes it can be. Hard to watch at times, so I think it was a bit more when you watch them games back there, sort of through the lockdown, it was a bit more up and down. It was all hectic. I know maybe there's a lot more mistakes made during that time, maybe, but I think that maybe added to the, the thrill and the excitement of the games. You know, you attacking, ball lost, a lot of team were attacking, so it went up and down a bit like that. That's what I sort of mean by up and down, you know. Yeah, so just uh, in regards to Mickey Hart, as we know, Mickey Hart is probably one of the greatest managers ever. Um, was there anything there that uh, Mickey brought in to uh, kind of keep the thing fresh, to keep boys motivated um, after such such a long spell in charge? Um, well, they just would have, the way he would have motivated their teams would have been just through something different at us. You know, maybe someone with the media said or something maybe that happened in games or just would have picked out the different wee things sort of that would have kept us on our toes and kept us kept us going for each game. That sort of way, it just wasn't the... Uh, 
the same not much stuff all the time. Every team talk or everything was was a bit different, which is which is what you enjoyed. You know, we just weren't going to see hearing the same stuff churned out and churned out all the time. It was, it was different coming at a different different angles, which was great. You know, as a as a player, that's what you wanted. You know, you wanted someone fresh and as new as much as you can. As I said earlier, the likes of the training was was massive in that. You know, the training was so exciting and so fast and frantic and you had to be thinking all the time, which was, which was massive as well. You know, you, you go into training, as I said, marking them type of players, so you're going to be tested and you're always learning something. And so Mickey brought that freshness and that new learning, maybe if you want to say, to, to us that time. And we were all that young and just w- soaked up like a, like a sponge. And it was just sort of, sort of an exciting time that to be involved in. That, and I suppose he, he bankrolled that or rolled, rolled it out like, and we all sort of rolled in behind it and, and really enjoyed it. Yeah, and then in regards to Mickey going to Loud, um, do you think that was that's a wise decision? As we know, where uh, Pete McGrath done a year on Loud, and I think he said it was a bit of a regret to take that job. Um, you'd probably, I suppose, you'd back Mickey to maybe, you know, get the Pete the boys back out playing. We know there's a lot of good club footballers in Loud. I'd say he'd be a good man to motivate them to get back into the county panel and be very exciting times there for Loud. Hopefully. Uh-huh. I think so is right. I, you know, as I say, experienced manager, as a club player in Louth, you only want to go out and try and impress him as much as you can through the club championship and try and to make make that panel of Louth definitely would be. But no, Mickey, he's a, he's very determined. He's he's very motivated. That's probably why he took the job. I don't think he was out of he, they were Louth were in contact for with him fairly quick after the only goal game. You know, so they they are ambitious, which is a good sign for them too. The 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 county board want to be ambitious and, and, and go places. So it's up to the players now to row in behind the county board and, and behind Mickey and, and Gavin. And you never know where it could take them, you know. So there'll be that freshness. And he's over on 21 as well. So he'll know what's what's coming. Or on 20, sorry. So he'll know what's coming there, that's the, 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 the production line. So exciting time for Lowe's. He'll, he'll give it a good lash, you know. He's, he's a, as a man said, determined. So he'll not want to maybe go out on a, on a low with having a, a poor period with, with, with Lowe's. So they be staying in Division 4 all the time. He'll want them to get promoted, get that wee bit of success with them. And I think maybe the sky's the limit for them. You know, why not go out and everybody thinks allows that maybe they'll not do well paid, but you never know. Give them a chance. And they'll probably need a wee bit of time, like their own throne management at the minute, and new throne management at the minute. They need a bit of time. So, so Mickey, he'll a bit of time to, to get Lowe's up and going again. Yeah, exciting times. It'll be, it'll be great to keep an eye on that. John, I'll bring you back again. Yeah, and... I suppose the Ulster Championship over the years, Connor, like just a seriously, seriously competitive province, hands down, and it, it trumps every other province, really, yeah, Connor. What was it like to play in over the years, hot and spicy, I suppose? <laughs> it was, I definitely was, I, a few odd tussles here and there, but I definitely was someone to be in its own relish, you know, I think Mickey come in, and I don't think that Throne had won that many titles just before Mickey had taken over, maybe it was just five or six, something like that, the, the record hadn't been, hadn't been that great, and he's won... Was it maybe six, he's won six now or something like that? Is it he won six or something and around that? So yeah. he's really well to tr- thrown up there, you know. So, but we always relished it. was set out the start of the year, do well in the National League, take each game as it comes. But once we come championship time, it was also championship. We always wanted to win also championship, no matter who we're playing or what back door or front door. You know, it was always also championship, and we really look forward to playing that. And like, you no know, better time going to Clonus, for example, and playing, you know, the Cavans or Donegal's or you know, just mighty atmosphere like and couple of ten games in Casement Park, full house, it was and it was mighty and then most of the final, a couple of the finals we played in and Clonus, full house was was good games to be playing in, you know, and surfers was mighty warm days and it just was someone that you as a going as a, as a kid, I remember going to games with my dad or my family, you know, it was just one that could I get to be playing there. My club mates were playing that I looked up to were always playing there. So it just was a, a, a drive or determination for myself. I loved to be playing uh, almost the final day for Corona and Clonus, and thankfully I did that a few times, you know. So just, uh, I think, as you said, amazing competition. I think hopefully they can retain it over the next number of years. A lot of chat about changing it and different styles of championship, but I think hard to bit the provincial sometimes. If they can retain it some way, it would, it would definitely benefit Ulster teams anyway. I know at the minute, uh, Ulster, as you say, is the most competitive, I think is, is right. But if they can retain it a wee bit, some way that Ulster get their Ulster Championship played, I think it would be highly beneficial for all the, all the counties in Ulster. Yeah, definitely. It's like anything else, preparation is key for anything in life. And how important is the Ulster Championship to have a good All-Ireland campaign? Because we have seen a definitely down here, Cav, and it was very good preparation for us, uh, say, last year. 
over the years, it definitely served you um, a lot of uh, purpose, I suppose, Connor. I definitely did. As I say, it was always a driving force for us to win the Ulster Championship. Say, Throne didn't have that many before we started, so we wanted to add that tally as best we could. But definitely was an enjoyable. We always wanted to always wanted to win it. Uh, didn't always work out like that, you know, for us. But fortunately, a couple a bit early on, a couple of seasons in that, you know, very disappointing. We could have won more, I think. Could have we could have challenged a bit more, you know, like Sir Armand, Donegal and Ian Monaghan. Teams like that were, were were going strong in the naughty, so it was hard to keep it going every year maybe that's where just we fell down and get the everybody wanted to win it you know as I say it was that competitive it just was that bit hard but we always thrived on almost the championship day it was something we really look forward to yeah and then uh, this current uh, Tyrone crop of players um, some very talented players there now um, of course they've got Fergal Logan and um, Brian Duhor in there now um, how do you think you obviously know them boys well um how do you think they'll they'll get on with the, the throne panel this year? That's that's if hopefully we have the championship. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully have a championship. I suppose uh, to go for a difficult time. Uh, I suppose trying to get new boys integrated into the panel and probably a lot of stuffs over Zoom and all the rest. It's a bit difficult for them, but knowing them two men, especially Brian, like they'll be determined again. They'll want to get thrown back up again down at the top table. So Mickey has uh, has changed the mindset within the players, within the county supporters, and also. It's over so them two men now to really drive the thing on. They have a good backroom team as well. So Peter Donnelly's back in, which is I think is massive, massive for them. So it is. So again, just like Mickey Hart is most allowed, they need a wee bit of time just to get the thing up and running, get their style of play. Um, the sort of feeling you would think sometimes that new management come in now, they're going to step away from the descent, defensive style of football. It's going to be all out attacking with the likes of Cahill McShane back from injury. You have Conor McKenna back home from Australia. So uh, you have Derek Yanneman, sort of three top class forwards. So a lot of people are probably thinking, right, it's just going to be this open attacking style of football. I think thrown if they do that, they could be caught out you know, against the bigger teams. So there's still going to be that wee bit of element of defensive. You have to mind the house first of all, I think, before they can really, really get into the offensive side of stuff, that attacking style. So I think just need, people need to be a bit patient with them. Results might go the way they start off. You never, you never know. But just need to be patient and give them a bit of time to implement their squad, get their squad settled, get a settled team and get a settled style of play. So just take a bit of time and hopefully they get that and people will be patient with them and don't be, you know, there'll be a lot of negativity about maybe players playing bad or people taking off or not starting and stuff. As you can see it ticks off at social media, especially. You seen the lad from rugby yesterday, like the abuse he got, you know, it was, you know, it's crazy, like, you know, people make mistakes and that happens. So, just need a bit of time, both players and, and management, to, to, to integrate the whole thing in together. Yeah, and I suppose if they do see a bit of attack in play, um, I suppose once the football's good, you know, it's all about if, if the supporters and that, they can see the progress, um, the thing should be uh, decent enough, all right, for a while. Um, just in regards to uh, the whole systems, you know, the game has changed over the years, as you say, a, a few years couple of years back it was quite open um playing as a defender would you have rather maybe a you know a man-on-man uh, game or would you rather have more of a defensive system and play um were you more comfortable uh playing in a defensive system or what would you have preferred and um, when you're marking the likes of Porek joyce or colin cooper i needed all the help i could get you know as boy, <laughs> go back, back they weren't listening to me you know so i just had to struggle on myself but um no hey I probably enjoyed some of them battles, you know, as I say, Mark and likes of Park Joyce or Matty Ford or Cooper or Michael Meehan or boys like that, you know, it was just where Dennis Glennon from Westmead was another tough man I always found hard to mark, like, so uh, I, didn't, I always enjoyed them battles, so Mickey would have maybe given me the job of marking some of them boys and I suppose it was a challenge of relish sometimes. I think now that maybe that's going out of the game a wee bit, you know, sometimes, as you say, it's all this defensive cover, going out of the game, maybe that sort of man and man and you don't see a wild pile of it now in games. It's hard to, so it's hard to get that. So maybe the defensive quality has gone out of the game a wee bit. You know, more than individual tackling and stuff. It's more the, a lot of yarding and shadowing and don't maybe let them pass. You know, let them have a wee bit of time in the ball. You know, so you couldn't afford the good or the boys that much time in the ball or the big game over. So I would a wee bit maybe enjoy it a wee bit. You had a wee bit of cover, but sometimes we would have done a wee bit of that. You know, Lexi Duker would have dropped down and would have covered some of the times. You know, but generally, you nearly would have been fight your own corner. So. 
it would have been sort of 50 50 enjoyed the the one on one stuff but again like to be a bit of backup you know as well some things yeah definitely so um bring you back again john yeah and I suppose, Connor, like the role of centre half back, and it's probably again as Niall keeps alluding to, everything's changed in the last couple of years. Like, again, obviously on the modern game, like we're obviously watching a lot of football. How much has it changed, Connor? Because like you know, at the end of the day, players are getting up the pitch, to are taking scores and all that kind of crack. But did you like mind in the house, or did you like getting up the field? Like, did you have a good, uh, did you have a good score and boot on you? <laughs> I didn't mind getting up the house, but the likes of Davy Hart and Ricey away ahead of me, so in Philly Jordan, I, I had to stay back and mind the house, you know, they were all gone, so I couldn't get ahead of them, they were too fast, so I had to stand and mind the house. I suppose Santa Hop back, I enjoyed Santa Hop back, that was sort of my favourite position, really, so you could stand and orchestrate and talk and communicate, and you could sort of see what's happening around you, you could maybe go and push and mark the, the Santa Hop forward if you happen to go deep. And, and look ball or you could drop off and, and organise or, or, or cover a wee bit there you know so really did enjoy it the, most, the modern day footballer now is they're so athletic they're, they're powerful and can just go up and down the field you know you look at the likes of Tiernan McKeon or Matty Donnelly at the minute they're just so powerful and they're running just up and down steady you know I don't think that would I don't think that would suited my game going up and down like that it would have been I'd have let a few boys go on ahead I'd just mind the house you know but it's uh, very, as we all know, like it's a really tactical game now. It's a highly tactical, it's a highly, highly thinking game. You know, you have to have really, really smart footballers. Not saying that we didn't have really smart footballers, but so much tactically aware now that it's nearly through the roof. Like you have to be, you have to be really analysing as a player what all the teams, how they set up. You know, it's just not good enough now to go to a team meeting half an hour or an hour before a match and, and analysing. You have to be sitting at home analysing. What we would have done a wee bit of that yourself, surely, but it's just so you have to be watching hours and hours of tape nearly now how all the teams are defending, how all the teams are attacking, and, and do that a lot of that work now as well as as pitch work or training or getting your fitness level up. The the video analysis is a is a high high part to play in it now nowadays. Hundred percent. And we were marked on some of your All Ireland wins. Um, obviously you were part of the O three O uh, five and O eight squad and. You know, yeah. it, it's 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 an amazing feeling, obviously, to win one. And uh, unfortunately, we 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 down here in Calgary we haven't experienced one in so long. But how special of a feeling is it? Like, let's even touch on O3, say Connor. Is it a seriously talented group of players? What was O3 like? Like, was it just um, a remarkable year? I suppose. Yeah, uh, it was just a, a, a just on crest of a wave. Just we just a going and just couldn't get stopped. Nearly that sort of way. We just were. Just flying high, just and playing some great football and some great footballers, and we had we had great fun along the way. Some great characters, as I said, like and just was just amazing. But to be involved in that first line is someone that's that's someone that you'll never again never be repeated. Uh, someone that we'll never we'll never see again in Tyrone. Like it's uh, it's it was just uh, unbelievable. Someone you could dream of, like going to watch the line final in '85 doing my father standing in the old Canana end of my own, like and. Seeing the club mates and all and throwing losing just by a point against Dublin was, was devastating. And it was hard to believe that turn around eight years later that you'd be involved in the first Ireland for Tyrone was just as crazy, like you know, it was just hard to describe. And I sort of I feel like nearly as that that feels now that it really didn't happen, you know, that sort of way. I'm so still playing a wee bit of club football and involved in the club. But sort of did we really do all that stuff? Did we really have all them wins? Did we have really have all that cracking you know, that sort of way? It's sort of just you're in a bubble every year, sort of just rolled onto one all the time, and just was just amazing. And just when you look back at it, just crazy, crazy times. And the supporters and all coming on the field, I thought that was amazing. Like just to be, just to just lift it off your feet, just to the crowd come on, come in. It was just was hard to describe, hard to find the words. I just I wouldn't know what words to use to describe that feeling of just over, just oh, just so much enjoyment or over joy. Just was just hard to describe. Just amazing, amazing, amazing. Amazing time, and just really thankful that I was involved in it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I suppose uh, which I thought was probably a wee bit unfair. Um, and you know, there was certain people in the media or whatever. Um, were a wee bit critical of the tactics that their uh, throne were using. Uh, I suppose the most famous one was Pat Spillane's uh, quote of the puke football. Um, <laughs> did you perhaps even use that one, uh, the likes of that, as, as more motivation? Um, or did you just not really let it affect you? Um, what was um, the situation now? Nah, that would have been sort of Mickey's, Mickey's thing, I suppose. Doc, we're all aware of what he, what he said, you know, but again, that would have been Mickey's sort of thing that he would have put his wee slant on it. Like, and no, it definitely would have been used in motivation, surely. Like, it was, 
any wee thing to gain an edge or to give that wee bit of, bit of help to get us over the line. Always, always work, you know, and I bet their man to respond to Pat Spillane and them boys and Joe Brawley and Colin O'Rourke and all, you know, giving us a touch. Like, so it was just it was someone, just that wee bit of extra motivation to really to, to, to shove it down their throat, if you want to say, like, or really just to, you know, whatever to use boys like we're just going to go on and win the line no matter what you say like us we'll use your your what your words that you said we'll just use them and, and help us drive us on that even more and just give us that bit more extra satisfaction nearly that we won the line and we just says thanks very much boys for helping us along the way you know sort of way yeah and i think uh i think it's actually admitted himself whenever Kerry's beating these teams uh they're great fellas but if it goes the other way or the thing changes, doesn't it? Um, just in regards yeah. then to the to the training over the years, um, did you see much uh, much change? Obviously, um, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong with the to our own panel. Um, would the training maybe not you not have been out as many nights at the start and as the years progressed, maybe it was you were out doing something nearly every night. Um, how did the training evolve? Um, well, 2003, we were trained. We were trained on the Thursday night, one night a week. Leading up through the whole national league and everyone, so we played. You were done uh, a Tuesday night. We played with your club or trained with your club on a Tuesday night. You trained with thrown on a Thursday night, and you played your throw match on a Sunday. And that'd be it. You would wouldn't have seen the boys then to the following Thursday night. Uh, that would trade that would done right up maybe through nearly the whole national league, and then sort of just about a month or so before the championship, say for example, a month and a bit six weeks, we would have trained on the Tuesday night. So it would have been Tuesday Thursday. Either you're some match on Sunday or training on Sunday, and sometimes you'd give you Sunday off, excuse me, and you wouldn't see the boys into the following Tuesday night. So it's only two nights a week, really, or during, during the week. We would have done boys would have been but in sort of optional gym sessions at that time. They wouldn't really have been compulsory; it sort of been optional. So a few of us would have done that. I wouldn't have been a big gym lover like so. I would have been optional in that case. I would just suppose I was an electrician or on site maybe every day at that time. So maybe I was getting a wee bit of manual labour during the day. So. I felt that myself it wasn't too bad, so I just was happy enough with the with the pitch sessions. Um, so fast forward then, that would have maybe sort of oh three, oh four, sort of end of five, and that would have been built up a wee bit. Then you'd have been training Tuesday, Thursday from the start of the year, and then you're and then you'll begin. Um, as the thing progressed on again a wee bit more, would have added in maybe a Saturday session. So before a match, you would have done maybe a tactical session on the Saturday, just a walk through of kickouts or free kicks or. We things like that, you know, we would walk through a bit on a Saturday. Um, as a thing then kept going again on later on, sort of in the early teens, you'd have bringing into the likes of uh, the GPS and stuff. GP, I, that was a nightmare I hated with the GPS unit, like, because you wore every night at training. It was tracking you every step you go, you went, like, and there's pitch side monitors and all the rest, you know, it was getting high tech and I was going, oh, no, this is, I don't want this stuff, like, tracking me, like, you know, and, you got to read out back every week, like, and you were well down the list at this stage, like, you know, <laughs> you've been bluffing your way through sessions or just trying to do enough to keep up there, you know. So I definitely had from one night a week in 03, sort of up to maybe when I was finishing, sort of 12, 13, 14, you're into your GPS and everyone tracked and you had food trackers and everyone as well. You had a food diaries and all the fill out. You had your compulsory wit sessions with Mickey there twice a week, Mickey standing watching you. So it would have been. And then maybe six sessions a week nearly you would have been doing at that stage. And I don't know many sessions they're doing now with video analysis a day on top of all that. And, you know, it would have been a, a lot of a lot of demands now on a, on, a, on a working man, any man that's working on site. I don't know. They, could, they couldn't do it now. They just couldn't physically be up on site at half seven, eight o'clock and get in the hours, all the hours attend to be done. So it's a, a young man's game definitely at the minute for them. So a lot of changes seen a lot of changes suppose, and it's only got worse since sort of i retired since maybe 14 this has got the demands of more as i say yeah i suppose say uh, you have dublin too there now um that's that's supposedly what it takes um no one's done it yet but that's that's the work you have to put in um you were involved in some cracking games over the years um what game really sticks out in your mind um as you know the your favorite game that you've been involved in and who was your toughest opponent <laughs> Um, I suppose again the stands out for me was uh, well obviously when the Lion final in 2003 was was memorable but the most intense or most really hardest game I ever played was probably the Lion semi final in 2005 against Armagh. Uh, it was so intense, so the crowd seemed to be on top of us. It was uh, just the local derby game they had beat us in the Ulster final after replay, so it was we sort of had to try and get one back in them. Uh, 
that was Mark and Mark and Stevie McDonald that day. He slipped in for a goal and he got one back on me for the, the block and over three years. We got a back, I got a goal back that day on me. I was marking the ball over the top and I misread it, so it was caught out. So he got me one back on me. But just that was so to get over that line. And then when you see Peter, him and Muggsy, then sort of we would have banter then over that free kick for Peter to step up with Paul McGrain. I don't think the, uh, people underestimated the, the, how hard that free kick was, I think, because like he didn't, he just got the ball. Looked at the post and, and went for it. But Paul McGrain was standing, he might have been back 13 metres, he was back about three metres where he was, you know, when he kicked that, Peter kicked that. So the pressure that day was was unbelievable and so, as I say, so intense and the crowd and every ball mattered, every step you mattered took, you know, you know every, took, every step you took mattered. So it was just, that's one game that'll really, really stood out for me. The Dublin games too also was, was massive, then a couple of quarter final games, like the, the roar of the crowd and the hill and, it just sucked you in like they were, like I remember we there, there was a draw. There were draw made maybe when the qualifier, the fourth round qualifier, and the draw was made that evening. We got we got Dublin. Every player was just going, oh yes, playing in, front, in Crook Park in front of the Dubs. It was just someone really looked forward to in them games. The, the, the crowd, I mean, Tomas, Tomas Quinn, I remember two scored a goal in the Canal End just before half time. Oh, the whole place, the ground was the ground was shaking. Crook Park pitch was shaking that day. Just the roar of the crowd. And then kick out come and the uh, half time whistle went. And then the throne crowd started then. And then the Dublin hit crowd hit back again. Oh, just with the uh, winning through the tunnel that day, the whole place was, was vibrating. It was just someone just, you know, hairs in the back of uh, the back of your neck and everyone was just was, was standing. It was just amazing games. But they're sort of the, like say, then a couple of standouts that Ireland final in 03, that semi final against Armagh, and then a couple of quarter finals against Dublin. They sort of stand out for me. Yeah, let's hope we get to something similar in the next year or two with the crowds right. back. Um, John, bring Hopefully. you again. Yeah, I find it astonishing, Connor. Like with, with the, uh, I know. Look, everyone's trying to get that edge with the GPS and bits and pieces and training and all that kind of crack. But like, do you feel a lot of players kind of have turned away from the game? Like we have seen a lot of players quitting, and you know, the GPS is a bits and pieces. Like, is that kind of a bit of a, you know? Why am I being here? Like I'm not getting paid for this, and you know, I'm being tracked for everything I'm doing. Like, is that turning a lot of player, players away? Do you feel, Connor, in the last couple of years because it's got so professional? Uh, I, I probably could have, you know, but again, sometimes I think the mindset has changed maybe. But the players, um, like myself, that time when GPS came in, I thought, oh, these boys are tracking me. You know, they're watching every step I do, where I'm going, or how what fast, how fast I'm running, or how slow I'm running. Maybe more like it. Uh, but I think boys now the main change we bit. They want to they want the GPSs on now because they want to be at the top of the list all the time. They want to be the best. They want to have run the fastest. They want to be covering the highest meters. They want to be, you know, they want to be top of the list now. I think the, the GPS has, has changed the mindset on players we bit that they want to be on top of the list. And if you're top of the list, you know your fitness is good. Everyone's good. You're going to be nearly one of the ones being picked. So it throws the gauntlet down. You do want to be bottom of the list. You want to be up in the, in the top two, three, top of the list on the GPS, as you know. So it really has. But it's like of like Paul Mannion, you know, Dublin, as, as Jack McCaffrey over the last year or two, you know, Connolly as well. You know, for a team having so much success, you just wonder what them boys, how, how did they keep going? You know, did that, did all that stuff really just say they, they thought, right, just, I can't handle it anymore? They can't keep 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 going. So you have to admire these boys that keep going and keep going over the last five, six and have long careers. Who's like Stephen Cluxon and stuff. I know maybe it's not a demanding a position, but just have to admire the, the drive and determination players have now at the minute. I think I don't think they get enough credit for mm. what the you know, the lot of the day job, a lot of them still in the day job and still studying, have to do exams, have to do uh, papers and stuff as well, like you know, hand on papers like so it is demanding the man shifting I think they don't get enough credit for what they're doing and what uh, and the entertainment they bring. You know, it was massive there during the lockdown to ha- to, to see the all them games, to have yeah. them in the it was massive. And I don't think the players got enough credit for no. in a difficult situation. It was it was really a difficult situation and probably a lot of them had concerns about going back home again to another <coughs> their parents and, and family. So yeah, I think the they deserve credit and it brought it brought great sunshine into everybody's life, I think, everybody's life during the lockdown just before Christmas there. So fair play to them. I know it's, it's tough, but hopefully they keep it going and hopefully they get the maybe as you say, get the fans back in and 
fair play to any boy that gives up their time and, and, and fair play to them if they get anything out of the GA, if they get anything a wee bit any wee bit of endorsements or any wee stuff out of them, I think fair play to them. And you know, the more endorsements for maybe the smaller counties, I think the smaller counties is, is a, a, a struggle a wee bit, you know. As you say, they don't get much success. And how do they keep going? I think that's uh, massive. I think maybe the GA have to look at that a wee bit as well. I know they've yeah. had a bit of second year tournaments and all that <clears> now. It's, it's hard to know, but it's just a wee bit more incentive for these maybe smaller counties that haven't got the success of the likes of the Dublins or Tyrone's or Kyrie's, you know, at the minute, they could look at. Yeah, because it kind of brings me on to my next question. Like, you see, we have seen in recent weeks, we have seen Paul Manion step away, Michael Darren McCauley, Jeremy Connolly, boys like that, since last year. And it does kind of, kind of bring the question, like, they have so much success and it's nearly like they're kind of, okay, I've won as many All-Irelands, I can step away and come back. That, it kind of it makes you think, what chance does that really give the likes of Leitrim, Carlo, Loud, and the smaller, weaker counties, like, surely boys are kind of scratching their heads and saying, right, if the Dolan boys are tipping off, what are we really doing here? Like, you know, what's, what can be done in that sense, uh, Connor? I suppose it's a million-dollar question, really. Hi, <laughs> Poppy, I suppose, all right, hi, it's going to be a tough one to, tough one to answer, maybe, that one, yeah, um, maybe that, as we said, the chat about that second-tier competition coming in, um, I think maybe that's maybe it could be the way to go, um, but it has to be it has to be promoted in the right way, the right way. You know, I think that's the big problem. Maybe if not promoted in the right right way, you know, it's maybe seen as second class. And as you say, if the boys aren't getting the maybe day in the sun, they're they're definitely going to drop away. You know, the Dublins and the, and the Corks and our Dublin Kerry stuff are they're going to pull away altogether and never never going to be caught. Um, I think there's maybe a wee bit of more of the chat about the allocation of, of funds. It's, it's massive. Was it Sean Kelly, the president, back sort of 2003 and 2002 and that? They sat down and drew a plan up for Dublin. How do we get Dublin back up again? So I think they have to do that again now for the rest of the rest of Ireland or the so-called smaller, maybe the Division 3 and Division 4 teams. How can we allocate or reallocate our funds to help these counties grow? So I think something like that maybe would be definitely beneficial. And as I say, give that wee bit of promotion till till the games. I think even the, I think someone it's one in our own county as well that likes the promotion of the games to our younger ones, to the school kids. Now, how do we? How does where is the pathway? Have we got a clear pathway for a an eleven year old to to make a county team? You know what is out there for them? What's the benefits of them playing? Gee, I don't think there's just a wee bit more promotion of of for for younger kids. I know you have development squads and academy squads and all the rest, but I just think this needs to be a wee bit more wider thinking on, on our promotion of our games to really entice the, the kids to, to, to go out and play. I know it's a difficult time and, and funds is low and all the rest, maybe, but a wee bit more of thinking like that, maybe really getting down into the, the grassroots maybe of the, the G and, and, and the clubs. We've seen how successful the club season was after, you know, last year. See how, how many exciting games and stuff we had. So, just a wee bit more into the grassroots of clubs, I think maybe it could be, could be a wee thing that should be looking at as well. Perfect. And just in regards to Dublin, uh, I know them winning six in a row, you're maybe thinking how long is this going to go on for? It's, it's nearly getting impossible to beat them, you're thinking at this rate. Um, I suppose everyone throws their population at Dublin, but you know, if the likes of Cork, they are a very big county, I always use them as an example. Uh, you know, um, it's one thing having a population, but what, what type of structure do you think is probably going to take a lot of years, but for a, a county the size of Cork with a good population there, and what do they need to put in place to maybe close that gap in Dublin? Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a tough one, that. Tough one. <laughs> um, what do they put in place? Um, uh, it's a good one. Um, I don't know. Um, I think maybe the National Leagues, I think the National Leagues maybe could be tinkered with a wee bit. Um, a bit more, maybe more competitive again. I think they could still could be a bit more, I know they're, they're highly competitive, but I think it could be a bit more highly competitive again for more incentive maybe that, uh, let me see, if you're doing well in the National League, how does that progress in into a championship? Where does that leave you in a championship? Maybe something like that. I'm thinking so likes the Cork maybe do well in the league, for example, get a league final, Division One league final. Does that give them maybe a head start into a new style of championship? So maybe seeded then. So they're losing the league campaign as a seeded 
something that's heated into a different type of championship. Maybe something like that maybe could. I know they've sort of challenged someone a wee bit like that, but someone, I think they need to think outside the box maybe. How do we, as I said, get that interest in other counties, get them that there is a, going to get a, get a bit of silver away here or we're going to get our, our day in the sun. So a bit more thinking outside the box maybe. I know that can be hard, a lot of traditional stuff out there and a lot of traditional people there that like the, the straightforward stuff and it can be hard to hard to change that maybe mindset. But I think we're going to have to try and do something, something different. You know, how do we, we're just going to hop enough with one or two counties winning the next 10, 12, 15 in Ireland. Is that the way it's going to be? And we're happy enough that. I think we need to think outside the box somehow. It's hard to get an answer for it. And as you say, it's going to take maybe two, three, four years maybe to, to get that or, or longer, but just someone maybe different that could involve the leagues, maybe a bit of a, a seeding thing or something something along the lines, you know, maybe. Yeah, I suppose too, looking back years ago, you know, you had uh, probably five or more teams could probably win in All-Ireland now. Of course, you have Dublin, you have probably Kerry and obviously uh, up in Ulster, I suppose it's Donegal, or this Donegal team's probably still yet to make the breakthrough, funny enough. Haven't got to semi final yet. Um, who do you think uh, is probably in the best situation to challenge the dubs um, if, if the upcoming year does go ahead? Um, well, probably I'm looking at thinking of Kerry. I think they were stunned last year against Cork. That last minute goal really probably stunned them. Stung them. So they're probably a long winter to, to look at that. Um, knowing Kerry, what they've done down through the years, they've always loved that sort of been rooting off. And, Coming, coming back and, and really proving a point again. So I think Kiai will will be one to watch out for maybe, you know. Um likes of Mayo, Mayo again always there thereabouts, but they've a lot of retirement. So how will that all go down? They've a lot of new boys come through as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that team goes over the next sort of year or so maybe. Will they will they be up there again? Will have they the hunger them older boys have the hunger and the drive determination to get back again, which will be extremely hard for them. Again in all accounts they've done very amazing Without the success, you have to give them credit, like for keep coming back and keep coming back, and to show you the caliber a player they have and the, the strong mindset they have. Um, again, uh, the chat about you just mentioned Donegal there. Like Donegal, they have been in a semi final, I don't know, maybe it's five, six years, maybe or more. You know, so they are, yeah. they're really a team that should be, I think, maybe sometimes they're given a lot of credit, maybe, and making deserve it. Maybe they have one or two good enough performances, and then. Don't really come again on the big day, so I think really sort of they got really sort of inconsistent maybe on the goal over this last couple of years, and without doubt one of the massive talented players they have there, like you know, like the McHugh and that and Murphy and that, you know, just exceptional players, like you know, they've been there a long time. So if they get a wee bit of consistency maybe over the next year or two, they could be challenging. But I'm just still looking probably at a Kerry Galway again could surprise you, but. And consistency again seems to be seems to be their problem. Um, Tyrone, it's hard to know. It's just again probably need that wee bit of time maybe to, to settle down again. It's hard to know. Always there thereabouts this last couple of years. So it's just hard to know. What, you know, I think it's I think it's just up to Kai maybe Kai and Dublin again for next, for this year coming enough. As you say, everyone goes to plan. I think it's sort of between them two maybe for for Sam. Yeah, and uh, you're just talking Donny Gall there. Um... The probably our team can be caught cold at times. I know, uh, especially when Mickey Hart was involved with Tyrone, uh, there was hardly any real upset. You know, any team that perhaps did beat you, um, they were, you know, rated the same, or if not, at the time they were rated higher. No, was there ever a stage there you you were playing a lesser team, and was there anyone in training there seeing a boy slack off, saying this, thinking that game was going to be easy and that give you a bit of a shout or put you aside there to. You know, make sure you had your feet on the ground. Um, well, I suppose that's one thing of Mickey. Like he, he took every game as a as a as his own. You know, there's no getting carried away. You know, we'll just go a bit. We'll beat this team here, and we'll look forward to the next day. It was always just heads down for this game and, and not get carried away, which probably was a big thing in in, in us winning so much with him. Um, but you'd like coming in that team. You know, you'd you'd like to Peter coming off, Peter coming off the ninety five, and do her coming in the ninety six. Or two two tough years after getting beat by me in '96, or really maybe trampled over maybe by a lot of people who said me would trample over thrown in '96. So you like them men and Chris Lawn, you had Jared Calvin involved. So there were four or five men that were, were great experience and great to, for us coming in as young boys at 20, 19, 20, 21, 
great men for us to bounce bounce stuff off and keep us feet on the ground. You know, for example, won a national league in two thousand and three or two thousand and two actually as well. Won a national league in two thousand and two. You know, kept our feet on the ground. All right, didn't go to plan in two thousand and two, but they were there in two thousand and three, and really kept us kept us together. Kept us maybe seeing if you want to say. You know, we could have went off the rails altogether. You know, and not and not have the success only for I think for them men really kept the thing was good management and good training and good coaching and plus them four or five older heads really they were the driving force as well behind the whole thing they wanted they wanted success before they retired and was thankful we got it in 2003 for a couple of them and, and uh, 2005 then again when Peter retired and it was massive yeah good stuff I'll bring uh, bring John back again Connor you're probably absolutely sick talking about it and uh, there's no way in hell we're going to um, go a podcast without talking about it uh, the block from the rock, Conor Gormley, explain that block and what it meant to you. <laughs> just, uh, I don't know. Uh, just one of them things, like just one of them. Mickey would have taught us or would mention, like, if you're not involved in the play, get back and help out. So, for example, the play is building up on uh, sort of the Hogan Stan side that, that time uh, around midfield. I sort of found myself around centre half back, really, marking nobody. Ball launched in, uh, Barry O'Hagan launched it in over my head. So, my instinct was right, just to get back in here and, and help out. Um, bro, ball broke into McIntyre, flicked it on to on to Stevie, and just I seen Stevie going for goal, and I says, right, get just need to get the hands down here and close the eyes, and thankfully they come off the just the bottom side of my right arm, like so maybe another couple of inches lower, I would have missed it, you know. So probably a bit of luck to play in it as well, and as I say, that's the luck of the boss did out, and the, and the rest is history, but. Just one of them things, like uh, I know down through the that year, there was a few things went our way and a few boys made different <laughs> games and it was just the last couple of minutes there in the final was was just something that I'll never forget, like and just just amazing feeling and was, you, you don't think about that at the time, like oh I made a block in the last minute there in the final, it was up on the feet and get the ball back and let's try and get an attack again, you know, it was just one of them sort of instant instant instinct things that you just done and just as I say, thankfully it's out and it was the rest of history and so someone that I'll always be who's remembered for or just uh, it was a great way to, to finish that whole Ireland final is just to help uh, help to roll with first Ireland is just amazing to be involved in. Yeah, yeah, you could be remembered for worse things in fairness and uh, as well as that, Connor, like is there much <laughs> 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 you could um, is there much like say a training Connor like is there much that could, is there much practice of that because like I know like training over the years like you'd be, you'd be doing blocking drills and bits and pieces but do you feel like I look I don't know really what's going on in counties but do you feel that kind of skill of the game or that kind of general kind of play like is much of that practice of training or is it just kick pass and do the general bits and pieces or what's the verdict on that do you think um uh, it probably is. I think it is. I said maybe that one on one stuff is really going out of the game. The more probably a lot of time spent now on on, on making the system work, you know, making the defensive system work and where you're where you're positioned. So you lose the ball, you have to go back to the zone. That's your zone you you cover. And I think that one on one is really you sort of mark a man for so far and then you let him go. It's really going out of, out of the game and that and that skill of blocking or and tackling. I think really has you don't really see yeah. a lot of. Players being dis- dispossessed, maybe going through one on one nowadays, or a lot of blocking going on. Maybe you know, sort of, they said that sort of half yard and shocking and, and shadowing. You're sort of close that you you're not going to strip the ball off him, but you're not that far abo- far away that he kicked the ball over your head. You know, you're sort of in between. You don't want to commit the tackle, and you don't want him kicking the ball over your head. So you're sort of in that in, in between position. So I think there is a space for more out and out defenders. There definitely is, and a lot of teams. You know they're they're depending on the the backup to help pull them out of out of a hole. So I'd like a wee bit more of that in the game. I'd like to see as a defender, you would like to see that a bit more. I think maybe supporters would like to see that as a forward taking a the defender on, really going at him, going at him one on one a wee bit more. But because that's just the nature of the game we're in. But I think uh, some that they should maybe bring in a wee bit more of. I think that maybe down to the coaches as well. Who's we'll just have maybe the time, a lot of time spent on. As I say, work on the system, just have maybe the time and the, to, to do that, take maybe an individual aside yeah. and, and work on that stuff maybe, just just having that much time really, that was an amateur support and they were struggling with the time in it, but it's something that could be worked on definitely. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, 
And uh, you played in some great teams. Uh, Connor, um, who would you say probably was uh, the best player you've ever played with? <laughs> oh, there's only, there's only one answer to that, like this we baldy boy from my neighbours up the road, like, you know. Was, <laughs> he wasn't bad. <laughs> uh, that from the rival club, like, I could hear up the road, like, but... Oh, he, he, he loved to hear that, Connor, dude. <laughs> I call all the time, we baldy, like, but, sir, but a crack. But, ah, uh, hey, you know, just as a cub growing up, like, watching Peter Kahneman was... That's what you want to wear the throne games for, like, you want to watch Peter Kahneman and... Uh, Step in the same changing room as him and step on the pitch as him and step out as having, having your captain. Like it just was oh, just amazing. Like in his leadership, you know, he was probably didn't say a wild pile. Like he was, he, he was probably didn't say a wild pile all the time, you know, but whenever he did talk, he just was one of them people just, you know, nothing else matters. What Peter's, whatever Peter says, that's just God, just that's what he is. Like it was God to all us boys. And, you know, I could ring him up today and no problem at all, have conversation with him. and you know, asked him and he'd no bother doing it for you, you know, when he be we video or something like that you were doing maybe or, you know, we'd throw out a wee video for you or get someone signed for you or, you know, no bother at all but just, uh, just I, to me, one of the best players, the best player ever to play Gaelic football, like I know some top, top players and, but just to most he adds that wee back, wee bit extra when you were when you were playing along with him I hated playing against him right enough, couple of, a couple of championship final, county finals and stuff against that, uh, we played Eric Marked him was was a nightmare, you know, but just just one of the best, like the best ever in my in my in my eyes or in my opinion. Ah, yeah, yeah, completely different gravy altogether. Um, suppose looking back then that you're playing career, Connor, is there any anything now that um, looking back you wish you had done differently? I know you've won numerous medals. Uh, is there any regrets you have looking back playing, or did you just did you achieve everything? Obviously, you wanted to achieve. Um, probably uh-huh. a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Those, uh, yeah, you always want to win more, but I don't think there's any regrets. Yes, you maybe regretted losing this game or didn't win that game or should have won that game. Or, but you have to look back and just, just be grateful for what for what happened or what I was involved in, even down to the club as well. Coming to a successful club team and won four club championship medals, like, and they were amazing times too, like, and amazing to win win them with your with your own club or your own people, like, and just so so lucky, just and. Just so, so grateful and just just great times, you know. As we said, thrown one one hardly nothing before two thousand and three, like so one very very little. So the part of them times was just was special and some of them that will suppose just live live along in the the memory. They, they'll never be done again the first times and just just great in class to be to be involved in them and involved to so, you know we had many times off the pitch as well, a couple of mighty nights out and just great crack all together all the time, like with some. Like every night, you, you went home with smile on your face. Like it was the crack was good, and you know, you had Muggsy and Ricey and Andy McGinley, and you know, the picking and the slagging, and you know, Canavan and all them, Chris Law and Collie Holmes, and boys, was, you know, just was, was mighty, mighty be involved in, and just I just was born at the right time, thankfully, and just so grateful to get a to get to get in that team, and just as the rest history, and just yeah, you make. Friends for life there, or definitely. Some great characters. Um, John, anything you want to touch on that? Yeah, no, I'm amazed you said Muggsy. I thought he was a very quiet lad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Cormac McAnallan, uh, Connor, an absolute legend in Tyrone folklore. Um, if you want to touch on him and how much of an impact he's had on Tyrone football over the years, Connor. Yeah, uh, off now, Cormac. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe nearly that he's, that he's gone. Um, to us, uh, well, to me, you know, especially Cormac was Cormac same age as me. Um, coming into he was captain of the minor teams, captain of the twenty one teams. Uh, he was just he was uh, he was nearly a uh, nearly a hero to all us boys, and he was the same age as us. He was he was the leader for us boys, you know, in the same age as us. He was our he was our leader, you know. He was the man we looked up to, and um, you know, if everybody trained as hard and looked after themselves as hard as. Or as well as as Cormac did at that time, we'd be thrown would be in the Ireland finals every year. You know, he's so dedicated. You know, you've seen the wee journal and all he wrote out like you know he critiqued himself every every game and stuff, and even the training sessions how he done the training and all like you know that was way ahead. Like we none of us other boys, so I don't think any none of us other boys were doing that. You do that yourself in your own head, I suppose. But to take time and to do all them wee things was was just so special, and that's that's all you can say about him and. 
uh, I could just was to get that news that day was up now. It was just devastating nearly all over the whole world like that news that day. Like and yeah. it was so so sad and we we're just so grateful. I know in two thousand five when do her held up his jersey like you know it was you know to win that second in Ireland for him. I think he said we had the first meeting in two thousand and two thousand and four. He said that he wanted to be a captain. He was named captain, and you know with, with some great leaders in that in that team. And yeah. he, 2004, I've been 23 and around 23, just touch, touching 24 to be yeah. captain. Uh, to captain that team, he said he wanted to be a captain of uh, a great team. He wanted to win not just one alone, he wanted to win two and more. Uh, so it was just, it was so to get over the line. It wasn't mentioned. We never, Mickey never mentioned it, or the players never mentioned it. we need to win this for Cormac. But in the back of everybody's head, that was that was a great driving force. We got over the. A difficulty of 2004 and just with a new freshness and new determination about us 2005 and just to win on that second Ireland medal was just oh, it was just amazing you know just to, to see her holding the jersey up as said was was mighty and you know he said it should have been him up there left in the cup but brought a tear to every player's eye and play to every people in throne that day so it was just a fitting tribute that that he was there with us that day to help us over the line and i'm thankful done for him that especially in 2005 you know but a special, special player and a special, special person, and it was just great, great to play along with him and uh, great to call him a friend. Definitely, and I suppose that that shows serious resolve, Connor, because like, look, look, that's just not a box center player. Like he was your captain, he was your leader. As you were saying he he was just a legend essentially. To win that All Ireland in 05, Connor, especially if it's it's great to win it, great to win it for him, great to win as a team. But I presume it just meant so much to you. Oh, it was massive. It was massive, surely. You know, the relief of we doing that that day for, for him, especially, I suppose, how difficult year we had, the written off the final after he played against Sturma, sort of written off after that. So I had, and, uh, you know, just was good to turn around against then, you know, the Dubs in the quarter final, uh, beating Sturma again, uh, and beating Nick Kerry again in the Ireland final, one of probably, uh, you know, a great, a great Ireland final. It was just a massive, massive relief. And, as I said earlier on, that was a, the, he was a driving force. It wasn't mentioned, Mickey didn't, you know, put any posters up or any, you know, it was just the uh, back of our minds. We want to do this for Cormac, and it was just just a fitting tribute for him. And we done it the hard way that year. Like we played some massive teams, <laughs> full house and park every day. You know, the, the pressure was on, and it just showed you, like as you say, the caliber and the, and the mindset we had that that year. The mindset was strong. We were we were really focused. We were determined and. Nothing really is gonna. We had a few bumps along the way, definitely had, but nothing was gonna. No, nothing was gonna stop us from winning the ultimate goal, especially for, for Cormac, as I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good, uh, good tribute, there, Connor. Um, yeah, just as just as we were talking there, um, you know, the GEA it is, it is unique. You know, it does bring everyone together, and you know, you go, you might be rivals going to a game, but um, seventy minutes, and then you know, your your friends, you shake hands and. You know, so let's hope now, if it is safe to do so, we can get a championship. I think we all need that yeah. bit of re- bit of relief in that now, and it does bring people together. Um, you've been very good with your time there, Connor. Um, well, that's really appreciate that now. Some good okay. insight there. Oh, no, good to chat, please. Thank you. Good stuff. And you want to touch on John there just before we finish? Yeah, absolutely. And just I suppose we, we can't we can't finish up without your club, Connor. I suppose Carrick Moore. It's, it's where you start and where you finish. You're still playing away, Connor. No problem to you. <laughs> <laughs> don't know about no problem to me now, but <laughs> uh, 40 there, not that long ago there. So see how it goes this year. As I say, God knows when the club will get playing, maybe we'll be, we'll be county first in the, in the split season thing. So hopefully we do, but I'll maybe tip away and see how it goes and do a bit of thinning. And, but it's a, the enjoyment factor of it. You know, you've gone about characters in, your, in, in the county that time. We have so many characters in our club as well, you know, and, it's just good to be get out and get involved in it and do a bit of coaching as well. If the young two young boys there get involved in under under eights and under ten, so help out a wee bit of coaching to them, hopefully when it gets going again. So it's just as you say, club is, is be all and end all and I know every club's special, but you know, Carrick more special to me and hopefully I've to pass that on then out to the next generation and, and on to my lads as well and hopefully they get playing as well. So just as an amazing club and just uh, one of one a wee bit with them as well. So just so, so grateful to be to be from Gagmore and get the the joy and and the pride of wearing the, the club jersey is, is massive. Yeah, geez, that Connor, that's brilliant. 
That is brilliant, Connor. Yeah. So um, let's hope it is a good year for you and the club, and uh, hopefully we can see Tyrone back. Uh, I suppose. And we're on a man in hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we, we do need a challenger for the dubs, you know. So let's, do, hope, right. uh, let's hope at least one of us can maybe one of our counties can challenge these dubs because uh, it, it is getting a bit uh, it's getting a bit stale these days, isn't it? So um, right, uh, thank you very much for your time, panel. No well, boys, thank you. Good Thanks very much. Now. All the best. Thanks Take care. Much. Bye.